Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject today is forgiveness. The benefits of forgiving a trespass, the harm if you don't forgive, and how to be successful at doing it. With me is Dr. Robert Enright. I looked up in Wikipedia the word forgiveness. The first name to appear, I don't know if you know this, Robert, is you, Robert Enright, the founder of the Forgiveness Institute. He's considered to be, according to Wikipedia, the initiator of forgiveness studies. He's the author of, among other things, Forgiveness is a Choice, a Step-by-Step Guide of Resolving Anger and Restoring Hope. He's written several other books, and he even has a brand new book, uh, the name of which I have in front of me, The Forgiving Life. Just out. Um, He's also a psychologist and a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Counseling uh, Department of Educational Psychology. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. I'm honored to be here, Dick. Let's say you're a victim of a violent crime, be it a rape, a vicious assault. You're in a courtroom. You see the perpetrator. Why think of forgiving that person? Well, our research shows that when there's deep trauma, it's very hard to heal emotionally in any other way than forgiveness. When I started this work over a quarter of a century ago, for example, incest survivors were counseled basically to live with the pain because psychology did not have an answer and it would be unrealistic to expect complete healing. Well, Suzanne Friedman and I did a scientific study with 12 incest survivors, and they went from high depression, or what we would call moderate to severe depression, to non-depressed after they forgave. And a year later, they were still non-depressed. And that happened in the mid-1990s, and to the credit of my field, psychology, people who were interested in the therapeutic sciences began to take forgiveness very seriously because forgiveness therapy did better than conventional therapy and emotional healing from trauma. Well, let's look at conventional therapy. <clears throat> if you are the victim of incest, or I assume the same applies to some other things like, for example, rape, you can't get over that trauma. What was traditional therapy doing and how is it different than the idea of forgiveness? Much of traditional therapy is support, allowing the person to heal through that support with warmth and kindness and compassion. That would be more of the Rogerian approach. Or insight. Insight that my unconscious is blocking the anger and the rage and the frustration and then to allow that to emerge. Mm -hmm. And through catharsis and insight, we were supposed to be healed. But if you think about it, if I have blown out my knee working out and I don't want to go to the doctor, so I mask that, and then a good doctor comes to me and says, well, Professor Enright, you do have a knee in need of repair. That's insight and has been unearthed and you feel the pain. That's not enough. Mm -hmm. We have to do surgery. And I think of forgiveness as surgery of the heart where we go very deeply into this issue of resentment or even hatred. And it's forgiveness more than anything else in the world with which I'm familiar that can cut that right out of there. You and I both are old enough to probably remember primal therapy. Do you remember primal therapy? Yes, I do. Scream and get mad and get it out, right? Right. And you know what research shows in many cases? You get angrier because you learn how to get angry. And so the question is, what then does one do with the anger and even the growing anger? Mm -hmm. And forgiveness has a way of actually reducing all of that. But wait a minute. This is not good for the movie industry because you think of revenge and how many action movies are based on that, and you get satisfaction when you get the bad guy. That's very true. But if we look at October Sky and Field of Dreams, both Uh father-son forgiveness themes Uh that had very happy ending, both of them, and they're very popular films, So even though it's rare, the idea of coming together in warmth touches the heart and, Mm. in the case of Field of Dreams and October Sky, sells. Okay. What I'm hearing is if you feel a trespass and you feel anger, resentment, until you can let go of that anger, until you can forgive the trespass, 
your belief and your studies show you can never fully heal and get over the pain of the trespass. Is that fair to say? I would say it is not a belief. It is based on scientific findings and reason mm -hmm. that when we have a great deal of anger, it's hard to diminish that through the kind of techniques that psychology has invented over the past 120 years. And yes, when we forgive and we not just let it go, but we begin seeing the person who hurt us as a human being, as a person, mm -hmm. as someone of worth, that somehow has an effect on our emotions to truly reduce the anger, not necessarily to elimination, but to where the person is now in control of the anger rather than the other way around, the anger controlling the person. I might sound like I'm stuck on this issue of revenge, but is there some satisfaction if someone goes to prison who did a wrong to you or gets executed or whatever that gives you some release from your pain? Could we make a distinction between short-term release and long-run release? You certainly can. I have seen people who have smiled with glee when it's announced that a murderer who's been accused has been executed. Oh. And I always wonder, now that the cameras are gone, and three months later and three years later when there's no one watching, was that enough for the person? And I can't see how it is. How can the death of that person take away all of the misery, the loss mm -hmm. of the loved one. It really cannot. But, but if you forgive the perp, you're not ever going to get over the loss, say, of a child that the perp killed your child. You are not going to get rid of the injustice, but what you're going to get rid of is the effect of the injustice on you, and that's what forgiveness does. It takes the traditional effect that society almost nurtures in us, which is to stay resentful, and turns it more toward a goodness toward the other. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is a virtue, like justice, patience, kindness, tolerance, which is a sign of goodness that starts within and comes out for good toward others. That's what justice is. I stopped at a few stoplights on my way here. I was practicing justice. I was practicing goodness. Well, specifically, when we forgive, we practice that goodness paradoxically toward the one who was either unjust toward us or toward our loved ones, which is hard to do. And if someone can practice that virtue of goodness toward the one who hurt us, the anger tends to diminish significantly. Boy, there's a whole lot of press I want to do with you on that and the steps you take. Sure. Um, but I, I'd like to know a little more about the harm of holding on to that resentment. What does it do to you when you hold on to resentment? And anger. There have been a lot of studies in the medical literature that suggest, for example, that when a person is extremely angry and stays that way where the anger abides, the blood flow from the arteries of the heart begin to narrow a little bit. And when there is heart compromise, cardiac compromise, these arteries can narrow even more. And it could actually put someone at risk for sudden death or wow. chest pains. In other words, the anger can kill. And I'm not talking about any kind of anger. I'm talking about the unhealthy anger. Healthy anger, like Martin Luther King Jr. had, mm -hmm. for example, helped change a nation toward a softer approach to those who had the right to it. But unhealthy anger is the kind that crawls inside of us, and it's like rust. It chips away at us, and it corrodes our well-being. It corrodes our joy. And not only is the heart affected, one's energy is affected, one's emotions are affected. Depression, for example, is very typical when someone has extreme trauma with no way out. And so this kind of anger can rob a person of their joy in life and even of their health if they don't do something about it over the long haul. What are some of the most common serious assaults on us as humans? that cause all these bad things to happen? You can think of just about anything where there's major trauma. There could be the death of a loved one, the murder, for example, or what you had said earlier, Dick, the idea of incest or rape. Mm -hmm. But we can also dial it down a bit and not be going only into the area of the dramatic. 
If you have someone who's constantly feeding you disrespect, mm. daily at the dinner table, daily at bedtime, mm. daily upon waking, that, although the world would never condemn it because it's not loud and violent, can lead to this kind of anger that can kill a person unless they actually do something about it. Because the 2,000th injustice is a lot harder than the first, second, or third because we should have never endured the first few to begin with. So in other words, if we have someone who's caustic yet tolerable to a degree, even that mm -hmm. can chip away at our health compared to the Twin Towers. As an I didn't think you were going to talk about the ongoing things. I thought you were going to talk about the bad thing someone did to you. For example, your wife had an affair and left you for sure. another guy and left you with three young kids. Right. That kind of incident versus the ongoing because there's so many other issues involved in the ongoing. Well, the ongoing still is a pattern that needs addressing. And each ongoing injustice is an injustice. And if you think about it, it builds up over time like a weight. Mm. And so the, when it is repeated, the resentments actually deepen. So that's something to take seriously, just like the abandonment and the affair, and then you're left to raise the kids. Well, I, I do want to get to the day-to-day -day issues of marriage, but I think it might be at least easier for me to comprehend sure. if we look at the one deed and, and see how typical that might be, the person who had a marital assault of some kind, sure. i.e. the divorce, a painful divorce, whatever, um, and the person who can't forgive. They're angry all the time. Yes. You talked about the heart and the physical effects, but are you suggesting that if someone really feels resentment, it stays with them every day for years, or does it come and flow when they think about it? I think it depends on the person. But either way, if you think about it, let's again use the analogy that we have a knee that needs surgery, and some days it's good and some days it's not so great. Mm -hmm. If we live with that for five years, first of all, if half of the time it's miserable, that's not so great. And over oh. time, it's going to deteriorate and actually get worse. So we need to address that. But at the same time, if it's chronic and ongoing, we need to address that as well. And forgiveness can deal with both kinds of pain. Those that are sporadic, yet rob us of our happiness in this life, or those who we know are under the weight of injustice and oppression and have to do something about it. What is that saying about if you have anger, you're holding a hot rock or something, it's not hurting the person you're angry at, it's hurting you? I think that's well said. That's right. I think there's a proverb somewhere, a secular proverb, that says uh, resentment is like drinking a glass of poison and hoping your enemy will <laughs> die. Okay? Right. So that's pretty much what we're talking about here with this kind of resentment. Uh -huh. A lot of times the people who have hurt us are a bit indifferent to our inner world. They're not aware of our inner world. And if we have that kind of caustic, rust chipping away theme within us, we are hurting ourselves. Absolutely. Well, but I, I would like to get into the day-to-day -day marriage issues, but before we do, I think it's kind of easier if we get a frame on this from sure. the one act that was bad and how we go about and the steps to forgiving the perp uh, that you lay out in your perhaps one of your books. I mean. Sure. Let's talk about The Forgiving Life, which is my newest one that okay. just came out a few weeks ago, and any of the listeners can get that at, at Amazon.com. And I talk about forgiving an incident there, but then I talk about forgiveness as a way of life. And here's the one incident story. Okay. First, and this is big, you have to admit that you have been hurt deeply. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our pride gets in the way and we say, that person could not have had that kind of power over me. So breaking that kind of denial is courageous and it's worthwhile. And when you break that kind of denial, when it's a serious injustice, we tend to be flooded with anger or mourning or sadness or re resentment, whatever the particular affect is for the person. And I, if I may, up to that point, sure. you're not aware of how angry you are until you admit it? Until or? you admit it. Yeah, a lot of times we're not aware of the depth of our anger. It's because we don't want to admit the person injured us that much, you mm -hmm. see. That's giving that person yes. a lot of power. Yeah. But at the same time, it's freeing you from the reality that they did hurt you that deeply. 
So once we understand that pain, what I like to do, and I explain in the book, is we look at the complications of the anger. For example, we lose energy, and that's not fair. We end up sometimes being shamed as people say, oh, what's going on in that marriage? And so people are talking about us. That's an added layer of pain. We a lot of times tend to fall into, without even realizing, a very negative pattern of thinking where we think, well, everyone's just out for themselves. All men or all women can't mm -hmm. be trusted. And that's another layer of pain. Now, look at all those layers of pain that I just rattled off that were not the original injustice, but they were the result of the original injustice. So a serious injustice against us actually compounds unfairness. So we have to do something about it. And the next step is to make a decision. Am I going to start a good jogging program? Talk to a humanistic therapist like Carl Rogers? Mm -hmm. Talk to a psychoanalytic therapist like Sigmund Freud? Or get wild and crazy and talk to a forgiveness therapist like Enright? <laughs> and so they have to make a decision. Uh -huh. And that decision really is, am I going to start taking seriously the idea of forgiveness and use it in my life? And most people consider that the most difficult decision, the most difficult part of the forgiveness process, because it's like trying to start a new weight loss program or a new exercise program. You have to go through the door, and that's hard. Mm -hmm. And so we examine what forgiveness is and what it is not. This is if they come to you rather than go to the Rogerian therapist. That's right. If the Rogerian therapist will just keep smiling at you and reflecting <laughs> back how you feel. Yes. And while that's really good to a point, as we said earlier, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And so we would then examine that when you forgive, you do not excuse what happened. What happened was unfair, is unfair, and will always be unfair. We don't forget what happened to us, lest it happen again. We may or may not reconcile. To forgive is not to reconcile. reconcile reconciling is two people coming together again in mutual trust. Forgiveness is the exercise of goodness, myself, as a freely chosen expression of who I am toward you and toward others. You're, you're assuming goodness, it, forgiveness and goodness are synonymous? Forgiveness and goodness are synonymous, but they're synonymous as justice and goodness are synonymous. But forgiveness is synonymous with goodness in a specific narrow context of goodness toward the one who hurt me. And forgiveness does not throw justice out the window. We examine that in forgiveness therapy. Many people think that when they forgive, they have to cave into the nonsense of another and say, oh, well, I have to go back into this boss's mm -hmm. cubicle and do what he wants me to do or what she wants me to do when I forgive. Well, not necessarily. You could look for a new job. If someone has a partner and the partner keeps hitting him, them on the head with a rolling pin 12 times a day, you can forgive and probably ought to without necessarily going back into that situation being bopped on the bean again. Yes. So once the person decides to forgive and knows that they're not condoning or excusing, not necessarily reconciling, not forgetting, not throwing justice out the window, we, then the real work of forgiveness begins. And we start to see the person as someone larger than their offenses against us. We call it inherent worth, seeing the inherent worth of others. And we start as young as age five with that in forgiveness education, for example, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, where children read about Dr. Seuss's book, Horton Hears a Who, where the kindly elephant protects a whole world of who's by saying, but a person is a person no matter how small. When we're injured by a person, we say basically the same thing. A person is a person not because of what they did to me, but in spite of it. Mm -hmm. And as we see the person as more than their wounds against us, someone who is special and unique and irreplaceable, not because of what they did, but in spite, in spite of it, of them, yeah. that tends to induce compassion in our heart toward them as a wounded person. I would need something else. I mean, I would need to see why would they do such a bad thing? What's their pain yep. or something like that? Well, see, that's what's important because that's part of the inherent worth therapy the inherent worth part of the therapy, where to see that they have inherent worth, we try to see the wounds inflicted on the person, not to excuse them, mm -hmm. not to condone and say, oh, well, they're wounded, well, mm -hmm. hit me again. It's mm -hmm. to see that wounded people wound others.
-hmm. And as we see that wounded people wound others, we start seeing the humanity in that person rather than looking at them and judging them as evil incarnate. Mm -hmm. And that does tend to soften the heart toward empathy and compassion. And then the person comes to the realization, and this is important in forgiveness therapy, that the forgiver has to bear the pain of what happened. I had a philosophical debate, one of the best papers I've ever written, in Azure magazine, it's a, it's a journal out of Jerusalem, with a brilliant uh, Israeli philosopher named Yotam Benzaman. Mm -hmm. And he made the point on this part of therapy that when we forgive, we walk alongside the one who wounded us, and we're aware of their wound, and we're aware of the wound they gave us, and the other person is aware of it too, and it might turn into a scar eventually, but we, we walk with that together. And that knowledge helps humanize one another. And we don't have a bond necessarily because we've wounded one another, but we have a bond because we're aware of that. Now we're walking more tenderly together so it doesn't happen again. Are, are you together? What if this isn't a person who offended you you never saw again? Then you can still see the wounds that they have. Yes. You can share your humanity with them because I don't care if they end up in Kuala Lumpur. You do share a humanity with them even if there's no physically mm -hmm. present interaction in with In your own person. mind, sure is. Surely in your own mind and in the truth of the case. If you think about it, we all share the same blood circulation, the same kind of brain structure. We I have see. to breathe in and out. Mm -hmm. we, we all are wounded when there is trauma. And we, if we see that in the other, the common bond helps us to forgive that person. So a woman who's brutally raped looks at the rapist and thinks what? She looks at the rapist and sees him, first of all, as perpetrating something horrendously cruel. She sees that he is very, very troubled, and she sees the truth of the injustice. And then she also sees that this man is incredibly confused. This man has a sense of right and wrong that is warped. And she should be able to see that this man is in need of help. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he does. He's in and need. And he feels some compassion. She because? then might feel some compassion for all of his woundedness and all of the misery that has been dumped onto him that he is dumping onto the world. Mm -hmm. Not just her, but I'm sure many, many others. Yes. And when she sees that and is forgiving from her heart, she would be concerned for all the people who will be wounded from that point on by him. And she would be concerned about him in his woundedness, that if it could stop, not only would he be better off, but many, many other people would as well. And that's part of what forgiveness is, this bigger picture. Once you get to this point, uh, do we, we finish all the steps or is there well, another step? The another step after that is beginning to find, find meaning in what you suffer. Oh. Okay, Viktor Frankl, a brilliant yes. uh, Israeli uh, psychiatrist who survived concentration mm -hmm. camp, said there were two people, two kinds of people in concentration camp, those who survived and those who did not. And he said those who lived found meaning in their suffering. Mm -hmm. So when we forgive, we do find meaning, such as, let's talk about the rape victim here. As she forgives and sees all the woundedness in this man, she might be very motivated now to help rape victims or perpetrators of rape to heal emotionally and behaviorally, to help stem the tide of the pain in the world. That's a new meaning in life mm, for her. Sure. That's a new purpose in life. And then at the very end that we talk about in the book, The Forgiving Life, comes emotional release, what I call the mountaintop experience in the book. Whereas you can forgive many or most of those who have hurt you in your life, you stand triumphantly on the mountain of goodwill where you know no injustice in the world can ever defeat you. And that's the very end of the process. And then you want to truly give away this idea of forgiveness to others so that we can do something about the wounds in this world. Is there such a thing as evil? Is there such a thing as an unforgivable trespass? There are many people who will tell you certain things are so evil they're unforgivable. And because forgiveness is our choice, I respect that decision. But I, that is not a decision that we should then impose on everybody. 
because there's nothing in this world. You cannot give me an example of a horrendous issue in the world that at least one person has said, yes, I forgive. Mm -hmm. There are people who have forgiven the Twin Towers incident. There are people who have forgiven in the Holocaust. There have been people who forgive all kinds of things, like the murder of their daughter or son. Mm -hmm. I have a friend, Marietta Yeager, who was in a film called uh, From Fury to Forgiveness. It was on PBS. She forgave the murder of her daughter, and she said, I do not want the legacy of my daughter to be the death of this man. Many people would say that's an unforgivable offense. Did she kind of follow your technique, whether by you or just intuitively? She, did not. she, she and I met each other after I saw her on the film, ah. and uh, I was amazed, and that's why I invited her to the first ever conference at any university on forgiveness right here at the good old UW, Bucky Badgerland, uh -huh. in 1995. Uh -huh. Was she doing some of what we were talking about, though, looking at Indeed, what in the absolutely. mind of the perp and what... She was them? following our program without knowing it was ours, and it's not mine anyway. I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek. I have no claim on any of this knowledge. I'm a, just a temporary guardian of forgiveness. It's been around long since, wow. long before I was born. It's going to be around long after I'm born, after I'm dead, I should say. And uh, I'm just a temporary guardian of it, trying to be clear as to what it is and giving it to those who wish. Let me play the role of devil's advocate. Sure. Uh, you mentioned in a marriage, if there's a trespass and it happens over and over again, forgiveness can be helpful. It right. would seem to me assertiveness would be more helpful. Well, how about both? Let's take a look at forgiveness and justice living side by side. Okay. Aristotle told us never practice any of the virtues in isolation. They get distorted. Uh -huh. So if we're going to forgive, let's ask for justice. But if we're going to ask for justice, let's forgive first so we ask with a kinder heart I see. as opposed to extracting that pound of flesh and say, there, you deserve it. You know, you, you had mentioned to me something, and it might be such a big subject, I'd invite you back if you're willing to come sometime to talk about the day-to-day -day acts of forgiveness versus yes. the big uh, transgressions. Are they, is that a quite different area? Well, it's just as important as the big ones, and it sometimes is even more important because those who have the big traumas against them get all the attention. Those who have the anonymous day-to-day milder traumas, but I still want to use the word trauma, get no attention because no one knows it's happening. So the idea of support with that kind of situation is much more difficult to find. Mm -hmm. And so I consider it a critical thing for a person's own happiness and for reconciling to a happier marriage. Now, have you ever been mad at your partner? Uh, yes, occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> She's been probably angrier at me than the other way around. And do you practice forgiveness in your marriage? I assume all, you're married. All, yes, I, all the time. We have to. And I, I feel an obligation to do so because of what I study. But I also understand the importance of it. It's like a doctor who's thin because they've seen the dangers of obesity. I have to practice the thinness, so to speak, of forgiveness rather than the obesity of anger, because I know the consequences. Well, uh, Dr. Enright, I thank you very much for sharing this with us. I mean, we've kind of scratched the surface and given people a taste for how important this subject is. But if you were, in the closing 30 seconds, to want some takeaway or two or three for people to keep with them from this discussion, what would that be? I would say that wounded people are the ones who wound you, and you're legacy could be to take those wounds and pass more wounds into the world. Forgiveness gives you a chance to stop and give a legacy of stopping the pain and living a life of love and compassion where the world won't necessarily understand that or, or encourage it, but it will be the joyous way to live. Dr. Robert Enright, I thank you very, very much. It's a very valuable time you spent with us. I'm glad you asked me, Dick.